seemed he touched me. I know we've all been heavy burden at one point or the other, but then God hears our prayers and he reaches down and touches us. Amen. If that don't get you ready to preach, I don't know what will. Amen? All right. Y'all pardon me while I fix this mic right here. This mic doesn't project, by the way. This makes sure there's no echo on the video, which reminds me, I don't announce it all the time. I should, but uh, if, you are not, if you are not liked us on Facebook, Oak Level Baptist Church, do that. Sunday sermons are there. You might want to go back and, and uh, listen to them again. Maybe you missed something the first go-round. And uh, daily devotions are there. And uh, we also have a YouTube page, Oak Level Baptist Church. Uh, subscribe to that. Let folks know. Maybe you got family or something that lives out of town and, uh, and uh, you want them to experience uh, our, our messages. They can do that through those uh, outlets right there. Thank God for those things, but they should never, never, never take the place of our worship. Amen? Those things are good if somebody is sick, somebody's not able to come to church, or as I said, maybe family members out of town or something, but uh, nothing beats being together in one accord here in God's house. Turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter number 6 today, and um, i got to tell you something. I was studying on this passage and uh, studying the outline that I have on it, and I had no clue what we was going to be saying in today. But every song that we have sung speaks to what we're going to talk about. Matthew, isn't that, isn't that wonderful how God works, by the way? Matthew chapter 6, this is a poignant passage for me. Um, I've preached on it a number of times, but don't worry, you're not getting the same outline that I use those other times. Um, isn't it wonderful that we can preach the same passage week after week after week and come up with something new? But this passage from Matthew chapter 6, I, I preached it the Sunday after my granddaddy passed away. Um, he passed away on a Friday. It was Friday, August the 20th, 2004. And uh, 
on, on that Sunday I preached from this passage, and then that Monday I preached his funeral. So, <laughs> along with three others, I tell you what, we, we sent him away in style, amen? All right, but Matthew chapter 6 is a very familiar portion of Scripture. I'm sure that everyone in here is familiar with the Sermon on the Mount. It's part of the Sermon on the Mount. So Matthew chapter 6, we're going to look at verses 25 through 34 today. And I'll ask you found your place, if you're able, if you'd stand as we read God's Word today from the book of Matthew in chapter number 6. Starting in verse number 25, Jesus says these words, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, not yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought or worrying, can add one cubit into his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Verse number 34. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And today, with the help of God in this, this portion of Scripture, I want to preach on this subject, worry-free living. Let's pray. Father God, thank you once again for this day of worship. Lord, thank you so much for the music that we've been able to experience today. Lord, I, I've felt the presence of the Holy Spirit today. And Lord, thank you for the opportunity to give to your kingdom. Thank you for the opportunity to, to share the, the concerns that we have on our hearts. And now, Lord, as we look to your word, and I say it all the time, I'll say it again, as we break the bread of life and seek the sustenance that you have for us, Lord, may you speak to us through each and every part of this passage today. Lord, I pray for anointing upon the messenger because, Lord, I am nothing without you. I can do all the outlines I want to do. I can take all the notes I want. But if you are not in it, Lord, it is useless. So, Lord, be a part of this message today. Speak to our hearts this day. Provide for our blessing. Provide for our comfort. Provide for our well-being. Lord, speak to us. Challenge us. Yea, even convict us, Lord, if conviction is necessary. And Lord, over and above that anything that we could ask, if there is but one that does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, maybe come to church, maybe sang, maybe done all the religious things, but has not come to that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, may today be the day that they yield to the Holy Spirit and trust the work which was done by Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. There is no other means whereby men much, must be saved, but by Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we ask and pray. And the church said, amen and amen. You may be seated. So, as I said just a minute ago, this is a passage of Scripture that I have preached on a number of times because it speaks so heavily to us in each day that we live upon this earth. I got news for each and every one of us, folks. There is not a day goes by that we are not worried about something. This past week, we've had the remnants of the hurricane. How many people sat and worried about what might happen? And that's not an indictment because we're all human. We're going to worry about things like that. 
How many in this room, and you don't have to answer, please don't raise hands or answer, but how many in this room have been worried this week about some aspect of your health or some aspect of your family's health? How many in this room may have been worried about, uh, a, about a relative, a child, or something like that driving to, to a place? You fill in the blank. We worry about it. But you know what? I sure am glad that on the authority of the Word of God, on the authority of the strength of God, on the authority of a God who can, we don't have to worry about it. We can trust it to the Master. So let me give you the context of what we're talking about today. Right previous to the passage that we read, when Jesus is speaking Given the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter number 6, verses 16 through 23, uh, Jesus is just is talking about how we can't serve two masters. And he's right about that, by the way. We can't serve two masters. We can't serve God and money or God and possessions. Amen. Y'all have heard me say this before. I've never seen a hearse go down the road with a U-Haul truck and a Wells Fargo truck attached to it. Your, your possessions, your money, you cannot get anywhere with them. You cannot serve two masters, God and money. Now, that's not the message today, but I'm using it as a, as a springboard. I'm using it as a context. Y'all know that in the interpretation of Scripture, context is key. So Jesus just gets finished talking about you can't serve two masters, God and money. Well, think about what he's saying here in the passage that we read. He's telling us that we cannot serve worry and God. You see that? We cannot serve worry and God. We can't serve our fears, folks. We can't serve those things that concern us and still serve God. That's why we trust God with what's on our hearts. That's why we trust God with what we're concerned about. So the text that we see here is a text to overcome worry. It's a text for each and every one of us. I think I said just a few minutes ago, there's not a one of us in here that a day goes by that we're not worried about something. None of us have escaped the temptation of fear or worry. No one. We're all tempted by it. Why? Because we're human. Things might happen that, that have that tendency to stoke up some fear and some worry within us. But you know something? Y'all have heard me say this before. Worry is the opposite of faith. You cannot serve worry and God. You can't be worried about what might happen or what might be going on, but also place faith in God. You see what I'm saying there, folks? It cannot happen. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Fear and faith cannot coexist. And that's another sermon within itself. Don't get me started down that rabbit trail. But we're talking about a text to overcome worry. We're talking about worry-free living. And you know something I'm thankful for? I'm thankful that this text is easy to understand. I can't speak for the rest of y'all, but I sure am glad that Jesus teaches us lessons that are easy for us to understand. Problem is, we're hard-headed, aren't we? We don't always understand them. That's why we have to be preached to every week, amen? That's why we have to be in the Bible. That's why we have to be in prayer to God, because we still need those lessons. I sure am thankful that they're there. I sure am thankful it's not, all right, here's the lesson, the end, and then that's it. But we still have the access to go right back and be taught those lessons. So I'm glad that they're easy to understand. You'll notice in the text here, Jesus speaks of some easy to understand things. He talks about food, he talks about clothing. Now, Baptists, how many of us like food? I'll raise my hand on that one. By the way, if you weren't here two Sundays ago, man, what a feast. We like to eat around here. But he speaks of food and clothing. Y'all might notice I'm GQ in the pulpit. That's me. I'm not saying people have to wear a suit to church. I do. That's me. But it's not that important. But it's just a simple illustration. And then he speaks of the birds and the flowers. We see those outside. Simple, right? A simple, easy way to show us that we got no business, Christian, in wasting our time with worry. 
So this morning, as we go through this message, we're going to talk about some steps to worry-free living that we, that we see in this passage. Hey, you want to go through life with a sad countenance, as Jesus mentions in verse number 16? Or do you want a happy and joyful countenance in spite of what might be going on in your life? You want to be continually racked with worry? Or do you want to face whatever comes your way with faith? trusting God to handle it. Well, Jesus gives us some steps, some points for worry-free living. So let's look at them if we, if we may. The first one is this, look about or around you. Look about or around you. Let's look at verse number 25 as we jump off here again. Therefore I say unto you. Why? What, what do you mean therefore when Jesus says you can't serve two masters? And then verse number 25, therefore because of that, I say to you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, not yet for your body, what you shall put on it. Is life more than meat and body more than raiment? Jesus calls on us to look around us, to focus on, to focus on the fact that we are here, we're alive, we don't have to worry about it. Once again, we look at the context, verse number 24, Jesus says, you can't serve two masters, and then in verse number 25, because of that, therefore, take no worry about your life. Take no worry about your life. Verse number 26, behold the fowls of the air, the birds, they don't garden, do they? They don't go to work. They don't reap, they don't gather into barns, yet what happens? Your heavenly Father still provides for them. He feeds them. Now, let me ask you a question, folks. Jesus asked it, so I'll ask it. Are we not much better than that? I got news for each and every one of us, folks, and the, the, the love the animals and love the plants. People might get mad at me, but we were created as God's most precious creation. Not as perfect creation. God knows we're not perfect, but we're created as his most precious Creation. That's why he tells us in the book of Genesis that God created us in his image. So we are more precious than those other things of creation. The other things of creation we're called on to use, by the way. I like to hunt, and I can prove to you in 15 seconds flat why it's okay. But I won't do that right here. But Jesus says here, are you not much better than they? We're not much better than that. God cares for us. We can, take, we can take comfort in the fact that we can look about us and look around us and see that God takes care of us. But I love what he says in verse number 27. He says, Which of you by taking thought, or which of you by being so excessively worried, can add one inch to your height? Now, I would love to add one inch to my height. I went to the doctor this week, and they asked me how tall was I. They didn't measure it, thank God. But I said to them, well, when I was 19 years old, I, I measured 6'2". Now I measure about 5'10", 5'11", on a good day. How does a man shrink like that? I don't know. But you understand what I'm saying? Much as I'd like to, I can't worry myself uh, into more height. I can't add nothing to, to myself by worrying. Folks, you can't add nothing to yourself by worrying either. I know that we do it, but Jesus reminds us here that it's not going to add anything. And oh, by the way, it's not going to fix any of it either. So Jesus says, which of you, by taking thought, by worrying, can add one inch to your stature? None. That's the answer to that. Let's look at verse number 28. Why take ye thought for raiment or clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Think about this. Weeds are everywhere, ain't they? You try to get grass to grow, weeds grow. You see what I'm saying there? Even if it's not raining at all, weeds are still growing. This don't take God by surprise. But you see what Jesus is saying here. Think about that. Are you not much more important? Verse number 29. 
Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Think about that. Jesus talks about the beauty of God's creation, giving us the point that we need to uh, not be so worried about our own situation. He says, think about this. That beautiful field of, I don't know, lilies or other flowers you might see out there, do you know Solomon wasn't even adorned as such? It's a beautiful thing to see. And because of that, you ain't got to worry about it. Why? Because God's in control. We move forward. Wherefore, and this is the proof, by the way, of what I just said. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow what? Cut down. It says here, cast into the oven. Shall he not much more clothe you? Why are you worried about it? Don't you think a powerful God who's, who's intelligent enough to create those beautiful lilies, don't you think he can take care of you too? You know, I, I was talking about coming home after last weekend, and uh, I, was coming, uh, I was flying out of Chicago on Monday, head back to Greensboro. Some of y'all saw my, my post. Such beautiful clouds upon takeoff right there. How do we deny the existence of a creator, by the way, when we see something like that? But you see, God's got it under control. If he can make something that beautiful and maintain it, by the way, can't he do that with us? So why do we worry about it? Therefore, verse 31, therefore, because of that, Take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, wherewithal shall we be clothed. God's got us, folks. So Jesus implores us, when we have that, that time of worry, when those things come up that cause a concern, and we're racked with fear, and we're racked with worry, and, and we, we have a frown on our face, and we don't know how, how anything's ever going to happen again, Jesus says, look around you. Look about you. Don't you see the beauty around you? Don't you think God can do that for you? Don't you think God can maintain you? Look at what all he's done and created and maintains. Don't you think he can do that for you? And then I love what he says in verse number 30. Ye of little faith. See, faith is the common denominator, folks. I say that all the time. It's the funniest thing. People will forget that I say that. I don't know if they don't write it down or uh, maybe their brain's not working or what should remember it. I've said it so much. Maybe that'll be a sub, uh, a sub motto to our main motto. But faith is the common denominator. Faith. God created everything that we see. He created all the beauty of the universe. He's going to take care of us. All we got to do is have faith in that. Jesus says, look about you. Have faith in what God can, take, can do for you to take care of you. You're much more important than birds or flowers. Although they're beautiful, they're fun, but we're much more important to God. He's going to take care of us just like he takes care of them. Why? Because we are the object of God's love and attention. We are the object of God's love. You see, all those things that I mentioned and Jesus mentioned that God created, that we see about us, you see, they don't have to do anything. Isn't it something that a plant obeys God, but God's people won't obey God? Isn't it something how even in the midst of a drought, a, a, a weed will grow um, better than your grass? Because God said to grow, but yet we claim the name of Christ and we don't, we don't obey what God says to do. See how many empty pews are in this building today. Why? I know that some people are unable to be here physically, but there are many more that are able to be here physically. What's more important? See what I'm saying there? The weed obeys God. How come we don't? We are much more important. We're the object of God's love. You see, like I said a minute ago, the weeds of the field, they do what God said to do. We have to keep being reminded what God says to do. But we're the object of his, his love and affection. But I'm about to get on another rabbit trail, so I don't need to. 
Here's the bottom line. God's taking care of you and will continue to take care of you. God takes care of everything that you see around you and He will take care of you. And the only thing we need to do is trust that. I could stop right there, but there are more points. Here's the next one. Look above you. Jesus said, look about you, look at everything that, that you see around you, and you know that God did it and He can take care of you, but look above you. Basically, what's He saying there? He's saying, look to God. You see, here's the thing. God knows what we need. Let's look at verse number 32. For after all these things the Gentiles seek. Now, I'm going to stop right there real quick and give you, give you the, the interpretation here. See, Jesus says this about the Gentiles because, remember, he's speaking in this context to the Jews. The Gentiles have not yet been evangelized at this point. Okay? So that's why he says, after all these things the Gentiles seek. Why? Because the Gentiles don't know faith yet. So they naturally look after what they're wearing, and they look after what they're going to eat, and they look after their money and all those kind of things. There are some modern-day Gentiles nowadays, isn't it? But that's the reason he said, for after all these things the Gentiles seek. But verse number 32, he says this to the Jews in this context, and thank God he says it, he says it to us in our context. For your heavenly Father knows you have need of all these things. God knows what we need. Man, what comfort we find in those words right there. Even when we think we know what we need, which is nine times out of ten false, God knows what we need. And here's the good news. He's going to take care of what we need. You see, nothing takes him by surprise. The person that, sadly, I wish it didn't happen, but there's nothing we can do about that. The person that may experience bankruptcy... Oh, no, God has left me. I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to provide. Hey, nothing takes God by surprise. I like that nothing takes God by surprise. We need to get, get an understanding of that, by the way. Because we, we think that God has turned away momentarily, and we see the problems going on in the world, and we say, uh, where is God in all of this? I've had people ask me that before. Where is God? When I'm dealing with sorrow? Where is God when I get an injury? Where is God when I'm sick? Hey, God is right there. He never promised that we would not have those things, folks. That is something we've got to get into our minds. He never promised that we're never going to have difficulty. What He did promise is that He's going to be with us through that difficulty. What is our job? To trust that. God knows what we need. Nothing takes him by surprise. Think about this. While we sit around worrying, God's working. While we sit around fearful, God is aware. You know what? This year, y'all know it, it's an election year. It's going to be exciting, I think. It's definitely going to be a lot of fun to watch. And you know, we mope around worried about it. What's going to happen? God already knows it. And no matter what happens, we don't know it yet, but no matter what happens, Christian, we must continue to trust God with it because he already knows it. He hadn't forgotten us. He hadn't left us. We just need to trust him. Why? Because he knows it. So it says, don't act like the Gentiles. Don't act like those that have no faith. You know something? Worry spoils our testimony. If we're moping around worried about something that's going on, what does that say in our standing in the kingdom of God? What does that say to people that see us and know that we claim the name of Christ? I've got news for you. Others need to observe our faith. It's called being that visible witness. If you saw the devotionals this week, I can't remember what day it was, but I read from Psalm chapter 149 and verse number 4, He adorns His people with salvation. You know Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Wear your salvation as an adornment so that those around you will know that there's something different about you. Financial things look bad. Political things look bad. Health things look bad. And everybody's panicking. Everybody's worried. What if you were a beacon of light? What if you were exercising your faith 
in the midst of it all. Imagine what that would show folks. Imagine how the Holy Spirit would use that. Wear your salvation as an, in, as an adornment. And now let's look at verse number 33. We're almost done, I promise you. But seek ye first. I love that one right there. Does he say second, third, fourth, etc.? No, he says seek ye first. The kingdom of God. I woke somebody up there a bit. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And whose righteousness? His righteousness. And then all these things shall be added unto you. More comfort. Boy, I love that one. So it's a simple formula. Y'all know I'm bad at math, but I, I, can, I can handle this formula. Put God first, and he's going to honor and bless you. Pure and simple. How do we put God first? First and foremost, by uh, acknowledging him. He saved you, worship him. Worship him privately, pray, be in, his, be in his word, and then worship him corporately. I'm saying this to y'all that will watch this later on the recording. Be in the, God, the house of God with like-minded believers. It's our command, Christian. You know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It's our command. Nothing else needs to be more important. Hey, the lake is not more important. Football, football's coming up soon. It's not more important. I ain't going to watch it no way. All those things are not as important or shouldn't be as important to the child of God than being right here on Sunday morning. So how do you put God first? Worship, devotion, prayer, being that visible, verbal witness to the world around us. Put first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then guess what? All these things are added. So here's the formula for worry-free living. Number one, look around you. See God's provision. Look above you. See God's glory. And last but not least, live one day at a time. Verse number 34, take Therefore, no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. This is King James English. Let me, let me break it down to plain English. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow ain't here yet. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Simple. Live one day at a time. Stop being anxious about tomorrow. You know something? Your worry today doesn't add any strength to tomorrow all it does is drain your strength from today you know there's no doubt about it when we think about to we'll open our planner I've done it this morning I, I, I like to plan I believe if you make a good plan you can always negotiate the variables but you look at your planner and you look to tomorrow and there's nothing wrong with looking tomorrow there's nothing wrong with being prepared but don't worry about it why? Because it ain't here yet. The old song said these words, Yesterday's gone, sweet Jesus, and tomorrow may never be mine. Tomorrow can be tough, but it ain't here yet, so you don't need to worry about it. And here's, uh, here's another promise. God is alive today. He's providing for you today. He loves you today. And all of that will ring true tomorrow. So here's the plan for worry-free living. Remember that God loves you. The first thing that proved that was the cross. And then we see the proof day after day. We can look around us, see how God takes care of every th other thing in creation and know without a shadow of a doubt that he's going to take care of us too. We don't need to carry tomorrow's burdens. Don't carry them. And replace that worry with praise. And with positive thoughts. I ain't talking about the power of positive thinking, by the way. That'll get you nowhere. Positive thoughts and praise. What does Paul tell us? He says, if there's anything good, if there's anything praiseworthy, if there's anything wonderful, think on these things. I, I paraphrase that, I know. But it's exactly what he said. So here's the bottom line. Stop sinful worrying and trust God to demonstrate his love. Because he will. He'll provide every need. He'll protect you in his love. And he'll meet you where you are today. Let's stand to our feet and bow our heads. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. And Betsy, if you wouldn't mind softly playing our hymn of invitation.